Hello and welcome back to Abstract Linear Algebra, the video course where we talk about some more advanced topics in linear algebra. And indeed, in today's part 42, we will talk about so-called Jordan chains that are used for the transformation into the Jordan normal form. In particular, this video will close the whole theory about the Jordan normal form. So I can already promise you, in the next videos we will look at some examples as well. However, before we start with the important theory, I first want to thank all the nice people who support this channel on Steady, here on YouTube or via other means. Only because of your support, I am able to create these videos here. And as already promised, in this video we will consider a matrix A, which is a square matrix and has complex entries. And now we know such a matrix has at least one eigenvalue and indeed we can list all of them. So that's right, lambda 1 to lambda r and these should be the distinct eigenvalues of a. So this means this lowercase r could be any integer between 1 and n. And moreover we know that each eigenvalue has a well-defined algebraic multiplicity we can denote with alpha. And also there the algebraic multiplicities can be integers between 1 and n. However, there the restriction is, if we sum up all the algebraic multiplicities, we get out exactly n. This comes immediately from the definition, because the characteristic polynomial of the matrix A has degree n. And now we can simply fix one eigenvalue, namely lambda 1, and apply the result from the last video. Which simply tells us that A is similar to a block diagonal matrix. Let's call the first block A1 and maybe the other one A2 tilde. And here it's important to note that part 41 for the eigenvalue lambda 1 gives us two pieces of information. First, the size of A1 is exactly given by the algebraic multiplicity of the eigenvalue lambda 1. And second, our block A2 tilde does not contain the eigenvalue lambda 1 at all. Indeed, a2 tilde has all the other eigenvalues, but not lambda1 anymore. Therefore, it should not surprise you that we want to apply our result from part 41 again for the second block. And moreover, we can also just do it for the next possible eigenvalue in the list. Hence what we get is again a block diagonal matrix. So we get our correct a2 and something we call a3 tilde. And now we can use our two pieces of information again, which means we have the size of the first block given by the algebraic multiplicity. And on the other hand, the third block here does not contain our two eigenvalues. So the whole thing should be clear, we go through it recursively. Or to say it shortly, by induction we get our whole block diagonal form. Which means our matrix A can be written in this block form where the blocks have sizes given by the algebraic multiplicities. And there you should already see, this is almost our Jordan normal form. For example, we also know from the last video that each block here only contains a single eigenvalue. In general, we could write that the matrix AJ only has lambda j as its eigenvalue. And moreover, by the size of the block, we also know that the algebraic multiplicity stays the same. And this property is exactly what we have in the Jordan normal form as well, so we are already really close. Therefore, the only thing we have to show is that such a block matrix here can be transformed into a standard Jordan block. Indeed, this is now the last step and the topic of this video. So let's put this important transformation into a Jordan block in a proposition. And in order to keep the whole thing clean, let's call this block matrix simply B. And moreover, we can fix the size as k times k. So this implies that the only eigenvalue lambda of B has algebraic multiplicity of k. So this is the setup and there you see all the blocks from before are covered. And now as already mentioned, the result is that this matrix B is similar to a Jordan block. And as you might remember, this means that we can write it again as a block diagonal matrix. And there again we can say the blocks are b1, b2 and so on. And maybe the last one we simply call bm. So again these should be square matrices on the diagonal. And as we have already discussed before, 
we call them Jordan boxes. So the whole thing here is a Jordan block and the smaller parts are Jordan boxes. And each such small box has a triangular form. More precisely, it has the eigenvalue lambda on the diagonal and directly above the diagonal we find ones. So in other words, only these two diagonals can be non-zero. And moreover, it's important to remember here that a 1 times 1 Jordan box is allowed as well. I say this because in this case there is no diagonal above the main diagonal. However, it's a really important case. It can happen that the Jordan box has this minimal size. In fact, it can even happen that all the Jordan boxes involved in the whole Jordan block are of the size 1 times 1 because we have that when we have a diagonalizable matrix. So in fact it's an important special case, but now we want to prove the general case. This means we have to find the change of basis which transforms the matrix B into the special block form. And what we need there are the generalized eigenspaces, which means we can define the new matrix N by subtracting our lambda on the diagonal. This makes the whole notation simpler because the eigenspace is just given by the kernel of n. And now we know we can increase this whole kernel by looking at the powers of n until we reach the so-called fitting index. So as always let's call this index d and there we know we cannot get bigger anymore. In addition in the former videos we also have learned a lot about the dimension of this kernel here. It's given by the algebraic multiplicity of the eigenvalue. This means in our case here, it's already the whole space c to the power k. So we don't have any problem at all to find k vectors from this generalized eigenspace that form a basis. So the idea is to choose the basis in such a way that the matrix representation with respect to this basis is given by the nice Jordan boxes. And now I can tell you, this is exactly what we do with the so-called Jordan chains. So for example, we already know if we reduce this power for the matrix N, this generalized eigenspace will get smaller. And therefore we can just visualize the set relation like this. So clearly, in the end, inside of all of the generalized eigenspaces, we have our ordinary eigenspace. And now the general idea is that we can just start here with a given vector on the highest level. And then we can apply the matrix D to get a vector in the level lower than that. And then we do that recursively until in the end we land in our eigenspace. So the formula is quite simple, just take x in the kernel of n to the power d. However, it should not lie in the kernel below. And if we do that and we know it's possible, we get a whole chain of vectors. Namely, the next one in the chain would be the vector nx. And by definition of the vector x, it now lies on the level d-1, but not in the level d-2. So again, you see recursively, this works until we reach the last level. More precisely, n to the power d-1 of x is an ordinary eigenvector. In other words, with this construction, we already find d vectors for our basis. And moreover, because of the connection of the vectors, you might already see that the matrix representation is given by such Jordan box. So this implies that we only have to find enough chains to find the whole basis. And there you might already guess, this is what we call Jordan chains. And how this exactly works, I can show you in a picture again. On the top we set our highest level, which is given by D. Then below we find d-1, d-2 and so on. And most importantly, on the bottom we find the first level which is given by the whole eigenspace. And obviously we have to omit some levels so we don't mention the ones in the middle. Ok, but now the important part here is that we have dimension jumps when we go to the bottom. Such a jump is at least given by 1, but it could be higher. Indeed, the collection of all the jumps and the sizes of them can tell us how many chains we have. For example, we can always start at the highest level and do exactly what we said before. So maybe let's call this vector x1 d. And now we have learned we can just construct the next one in the chain and let's call it x1 d minus 1. 
And now we go down as before until we reach our last vector x11. So this is one chain which is always possible. And then we can go to the next one, but there it's important to know if we still have a missing direction, a missing dimension on the upper level. So for example, if this first jump is given by 2, we still have another direction here on the upper level. Hence this one we would call x2d. So it's the second chain and we can do exactly the same as before and we get more vectors for our basis. However, there you see it's important that we choose the starting point linearly independent of all the other vectors in the level. Of course for the second chain it's quite simple because there's only one other direction yet. However, if we already have more, it's clear they should all be linearly independent. This is important because otherwise we would not get linearly independent vectors in total. But of course this is what we want because we want to have a whole basis in the end. Okay, but now it can happen that the jump is given by 2, so there are no other directions given on the higher level d. This means the chain has to start at a lower level where there is still a jump to go downwards. But also there, the starting vector has to be chosen linearly independently of all the other vectors. So it has to lie outside of the span given by the two vectors from before. In addition, it also has to satisfy the other properties, which means it has to be on this level d-1. So in the kernel n to the power d-1, but not in the kernel of n to the power d-2. And then the result is that we also get a whole chain, which is smaller than the other one. And now this is the idea, the chains could get smaller and smaller, and in the last case, for example, it could happen that the chain has only length 1. And then in total, we should have exactly k vectors, which form a basis of ck. Which also means that the vectors here on the level 1 are eigenvectors, which form a basis of the whole eigenspace. So you see, the number of Jordan chains we have is equal to the dimension of the ordinary eigenspace. Which implies it's equal to the geometric multiplicity of the eigenvalue lambda. So this is important to remember, the geometric multiplicity is also given in a Jordan normal form, namely as the number of chains. And as already mentioned before, by the construction of the chain, such a Jordan chain forms a Jordan box. In fact, the size of such a square Jordan box is given by the length of the chain. And with that the proof is actually done, because we could just verify that all these chains are possible and we can choose them linearly independent to get enough vectors out. It simply follows from the fact that the generalized eigenspaces are nested in the sense we have already proven before. Therefore the only thing we have to check in the end is that such a chain really gives the Jordan box in this form. However, this one we can do in the next video and there we can also look at examples. So I really hope I meet you there again and have a nice day. Bye bye.